Welcome everybody to this week's edition of Lumix Live. We are back in a bit of a more normal, uh, you know, kind of platform than what we've been doing for the last two weeks. Uh, so if you are new to the Lumix Live platform, this is our weekly session where we have conversations with photographers, videographers, uh, other members from the community, whether it's from the manufacturing side, the, the educational side, uh, and then just also covering some, some photo tips, video tips, generally any kind of conversation like that. Uh, again, if you're new, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It helps us out dramatically for continuing to bring this uh, platform to everybody out there. Uh, and for today's session, we are actually focusing a lot on photojournalism and photography, but not in the most strictest sense of photojournalism. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, one of the U.S. ambassadors, Mike Peters, to discuss his career, his photography, what he does currently in, in uh, the photography world. Uh, but this is really a session, and like most sessions that we have, it's devoted to all of you watching. So if you have questions about product, if you have questions about Mike's work, or want some advice about uh, a topic that we're discussing, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before your questions so that we can address them during the stream. Now, as a heads up, we are going to be focusing primarily with the questions on the topic at hand. So if it's a question that's kind of way out, uh, you know, off topic, we may not get to it on this stream, uh, but know that we are always collecting these kinds of questions that you guys have for our end of month AMA sessions. So make sure to keep dropping the questions in there, even if we don't get to it this week. Uh, we will probably get to a lot of them next week during our end of month uh, AMA kind of conversation that we have. So with that, I want to jump over and bring Mike Peters into the conversation and let's kick this thing off. Hey Mike, how are you? Good, Sean. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. It's always fun uh, uh, reconnecting with with uh, someone from back when I was in New Jersey. So it's always a good time. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. Yeah. So um, for those that are watching, can you give us, uh, you know, kind of a background as to who you are, what got you into photography, uh, and, you know, just kind of like the normal bio stuff? Okay, well, I got into photography when I was in high school, um, and it was just something that I fell in love with and gave me an opportunity to uh, express how I saw the world. Um, at the time, there was a lot going on at home, and it gave me... Uh, you know, sort of something to, to hold on to that was just all mine. And uh, and it was, it was, uh, it was technically it was interesting. And then also artistically, it was interesting. And I didn't have much of a background in art, but um, I began to read a lot. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the school library reading pop photo and modern photo and Peterson's and camera 35 and all that great stuff. And I learned a lot. And when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to become a professional photographer. And uh, one of my neighbors knew somebody whose boyfriend was a commercial photographer. And uh, I went and I met him. He had a studio in New York City. He was just like the coolest guy, shot mostly still life and fashion. And uh, he suggested I go to FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology in the city, which is where I went to school. And uh, and then I was there for two years, got my associate's degree, which is all I offered at the time, and uh, immediately started working. I got a job at Tiffany's, uh, shooting in their studio, uh, shooting a lot of still life stuff. Um, you know, I started in, in June, and in, uh, it was in October. I had my first full page ad in Vogue magazine, which was really cool, and uh, did a lot of other stuff. and. But ultimately, I decided that that really wasn't for me. I wasn't really interested in spending the next uh, 45 years of my life in a dark studio. So um, after about six months, I left and I uh, had hooked up with a guy who shot for Architectural Digest. And I started assisting him. And we traveled all around the country shooting a bunch of different things for Tiffany's and then also for other clients. And I did all of his lighting. Um, you know, I was very comfortable with four by five at the time, which is what we were shooting. Um, at Tiffany's, I shot mostly eight by ten, and uh, and then I started to branch out from there. And I, um, you know, my natural path would have been to have become an architectural photographer, but 
again, I realized that that wasn't for me. I really wanted to photograph people because all of my heroes in photography were were photojournalists and, and documentary photographers. Uh, you know, people like Cartier Bresson, Eugene Smith, uh, Dorothea Lange, Dean Arbus. And then, you know, of course, there was Irving Penn, who was just amazing, and Avedon, who did like the most incredible portraits, and so many others. Um, so, um, you know, I started freelancing, got some magazine stuff. Um, this was back in the day when you could actually call an art director and go in and show them your portfolio in person. Yeah. So it was sort of fun. And uh, I continued getting freelance gigs from, from uh, Tiffany's, shooting Still Life, and then also shooting some of their designers. Um, and I worked on personal projects, uh, personal documentary projects, and eventually, a couple of years later, wound up uh, talking my way into a newspaper job, um, which then led to another newspaper job, which then led to another newspaper job. But after a couple of years of that, um, decided that I wanted to do really more uh, magazine journalism. So I left there and took my portfolio and started doing work for business magazines. Um, a lot of business magazines and uh, also U.S. News and World Report. Um, and I started getting corporate work, shooting annual reports. Um, during that time, I was also shooting for a couple of newspapers uh, in my area. I was shooting for the Jersey Journal, uh, the Star Ledger. And then eventually I started doing freelance work for the New York Times. Um, so... You know, I continued, uh, you know, basically through the 80s and 90s doing mostly uh, corporate magazine work. Uh, also started working for textbook publishing companies, producing images for their textbooks. Um, and throughout that time, I was also working for a bunch of higher ed clients. Uh, one of them was Montclair State University, uh, who I started freelancing for in 1987. And then, uh, you know, as I saw the the landscape of commercial photography began to really shift in the in the mid 90s where it became not so much based on what kind of work you did or the quality of your portfolio but it really became more about how much do you charge to take that picture <laughs> i realized that you know it's like okay i'm not really thrilled about this so fortunately in uh in 2000, uh, Montclair State had decided to add a full-time photographer position, and I applied for it. And um, remarkably, there were people from all over the country who had applied for the job. So I actually, even though I had a, a history with them, um, I still had to, you know, compete for it. And fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, at that time, I was the only one with any digital experience. Uh, when I was working for the book publishers, we had. Uh, shot with uh, Kodak, uh, the DCS uh, single shot, six megapixel cameras. Yeah. With the and uh, like the $25,000 one. And then they also had a, a, a leaf uh, back. So I got to use that. And I had also been doing a lot of scanning over the previous uh, five or six years. So I was sort of as conversant as one could be in the digital realm at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's that that has to be a, a a really exciting time during during photography, like during everything. That whole transition from film to digital, and how rapidly all of it's kind of grown in the years. Yeah, there was a, a, a tremendous resistance by a lot of my colleagues to jump into digital, uh, and you know, I was pretty much one of the early adopters. And I'm glad I did because it really helped out. Um, and I think that, you know, had I had I not had I not, you know, really embraced it, I think I would have been left behind. And hmm. uh, because it was inevitable, and it was it's what clients wanted. They wanted digital files. It, you know, very few of them were were asking for film anymore. So it was a lot of scanning. And it was a tremendous convenience for them to be able to deliver a digital file, made things much more streamlined for them. So, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, I replaced, um, you know, a lot of jobs for people who, who did digital separations from color film. So that whole part of the industry basically sort of went away because of the advent of digital photography, uh, as where before you, I would 
take photographs. I would drop off my, my color slides at the lab. I'd come back a couple hours later, or maybe the next day, and I'd go through them all. And then I'd put them all in a box and I'd FedEx them to the client. Yeah. And then they did it all after that. But now, you know, I'd shoot color slides, I'd look at it, then I'd have to scan them, and then I'd have to, you know, do all the other stuff that the color separator would do. I didn't get paid any extra for that either. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like you, you had to sort of reconfigure how you came up with fees and all that stuff. So it was a, it was a real adventure. We were all really sort of making it up as we went along. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I was able to sort of stay, stay with it. And, uh, and, and, and I wasn't intimidated. Well, I mean, it took me a while to sort of get over the intimidation of all the technical aspects of it. But at first, I, you know, I went out and I bought, spent $25,000 on a big com computer. And I stared at it for like a month and said, what do I do with this thing? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> got over that and uh and here we are yeah so. well i mean that's 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 also i mean that's 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 a, a really really you know a seriously impressive career you know being being someone who's been able to to make the transition work and and you know be very successful with it is is something i think that a lot of people obviously are, are frustrated with as they're getting in because we're, we're on that transition kind of again where, well, at least we've been in this transition for a little while where video is starting to become, you know, the, the similar transition from film to digital. Photographers, in a lot of cases, not all of them, are having to learn how to, to provide video work for, for their clients. And I think now, just as it was back then, like you said, it's imperative that you learn to some extent that you become somewhat comfortable with it, or you are going to get left behind. Um, mixed media is, is even bigger now than it ever was. Uh, but I want to jump back and actually kind of cover your, your camera history, because I think for me that that's actually one of the coolest things. Um, you know, when, when I, I met you back at MSU and for those watching, uh, Montclair state university is my alma mater. So, um, this is kind of a really cool conversation to connect. Like I said, with someone from, from my past in New Jersey, uh, your camera history, I, I think is one of the cooler parts that really actually helped solidify my approach into photography as well. Um, because at the school you had to take film courses. It was it was film photography. So, um, could you give everyone kind of just a, a level of you know what film cameras you you used to work on, and then your digital progression? How long do we have? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's go for the highlights. Maybe your your favorite of the categories. Well, okay. So I started with Olympus uh, OM one, and. Uh... When I was in college, I, I switched over to Nikon. Um, and I also, when I was in college, I learned how to use a 4 by 5 camera and immediately fell in love. <laughs> so I've had a number of those, but my favorite, my favorite iteration of 4 by 5 is the is a wooden field camera. Um, and I use that for my personal work for probably close to 20 years. Um, so I used Nikon for a while. Uh, eventually, I segued into... Leica R's, Leica M's, back to Leica R's, Contacts, uh, Canon, when they came out with the EO system. And I stuck with Canon for a long time and actually used Canon uh, into the dawn of the, of the digital age. Um, and, you know, fortunately, the university purchased a, uh, the, the 1D for me, uh, which was uh, the old four megapixel monster. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, which holds up surprisingly well. The images from that, I've actually made 20, 24 by 30 inch prints from, from that. That really look pretty spectacular. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, from the 1D to the 10D to the 5D to the 5D Mark II, and there was a push for me to start getting into shooting digital. I'm not digital. <laughs> I'm going to start shooting video. And, uh, so I had, you know, I had the 5D Mark II. I started playing with video. Um, I found it really clunky to use. And I had read uh, an article uh, by Michael Reichman on the Luminous Landscape about the GH2. And I thought, okay, let me try that. So 
I got this little tiny camera, and I thought, oh, this is a toy. This is like all plasticky. <laughs> it's tiny. It's little. It's got these weird buttons. I don't understand how it works. But I just started playing with it. And the video was really great. And then I noticed it was a lot lighter than my stupid camera, Canon cameras. So one day I had to go into the city and do a bunch of like cityscapes for the university. We were using it for business school. And so I brought the GH2 and I had the, the original 14 to 140. And, uh, and, you know, I had a couple other, I, I adapted some Nikon lenses to it. Yeah. And I went out, I shot, I shot all day on it. I came back and I was really impressed with, with the raw files I got out of the camera. You know, it's like, these are, these are really good. It's like, these rival what I'm getting out of my 5D Mark II. <laughs> so I started reading more about it and using the camera more and more uh, with a bunch of adapted old Nikon lenses. And, uh, and you know, and, and then I also had the, the 14 and the 20. And, uh, and I wound up getting the 7 to 14. And I discovered that I could use this on assignments. And the other thing I discovered is that with the pull away um, um, screen on the back, I could put the camera in places that I couldn't even imagine with a DSLR because I could turn the screen, I could see what I was doing, low angles was easy, high angles, around the corner, put it into scientific goods and shoot out towards the person working. It was like, oh my God, I'm no longer like, um, you know, I, I no longer am like attached to the viewfinder. I can put the camera in different places and see the world in ways that, you know, I couldn't do it with with a with a DSLR, yeah. uh, especially with a fixed screen. So, when they came out with the GH3, you know, I had my own collection of Canon gear, which I uh, promptly traded in for two G two GH3s, the twelve to thirty five and the and the thirty five to one hundred, and uh, I did that on a on a Thursday. And then Friday, I went out in the rain and photographed a, uh, a convocation at night. <laughs> and, and it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and that was in 2013, and then I haven't looked back. And I've been a solid uh, Lumix uh, user since then. And, you know, and I really believe in, 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 in what they bring to the table uh, in terms of the not just the... Uh, a reasonable camera body size, but it's really a sweet spot for lens design um, in that yeah. the lenses can be really compact and lightweight, but still very sharp and very capable and uh, and give you a great range without giving you a lot of weight. Um, I had originally, or before I bought the, the GH3, I was also looking at the, uh, the Fujis. And one of the things that, that discouraged me about the Fujis, at least with the X-Pro1, is that it didn't have an adjustable diopter which is a huge thing, which made it sort of unusable for me. But I noticed that the lenses were not that much smaller than my full-frame lenses, and that the lenses in the Micro Four Thirds system were significantly smaller. And, uh, and you know, I, throughout my life, I've had a lot of problems with my back um, from, you know, carrying gear. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I've, I've spent many hours walking through city streets with way too much equipment, and coming home at the end of the day and not being able to move. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I used to shoot on the street with a Hasselblad. Uh, I had a set of 2003 FCWs and a couple lenses, and they're really heavy. And I'd go out, and, uh, you know, I, I felt like somebody was driving a railroad spike into my spine. And uh, yeah. now I can walk around all day, and I don't get that. <laughs> so, and that's the thing. Uh, you know, so... In, 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 early, in the early 2000s, I transitioned from shooting 4x5 for my personal work to two and a quarter um, because it was more portable and, uh, and more affordable. 4x5 uh, is you know, prohibitively expensive. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, I need to stop shooting 4x5. So I, I shot, started shooting with a Roloflex and then moved on to Hasselblad's. And... Uh, I discovered, I did a little test with my GH3 and my 20 millimeter lens and my Hasselblad and my 80 millimeter lens. And I shot pictures of my son with both. And I scanned the Hasselblad image on an Imicon scanner. 
and I just pulled the uh, raw file out of my camera and I put them side by side and there was no contest. The image quality that I was getting out of the Lumix was actually better than I was getting out of the Hasselblad. In That's impressive. Uh, so it was like, okay, so I, I can I can sell the Hasselblads now and just transition my personal work from film because I was still shooting film back in, um, I think it was 2014. And I finally transitioned away from film for my personal work into shooting digital. Well, and I, I shoot the Lumix in square format. Yeah. Well, it's, that's, that's definitely, I mean, really, really, you know, impressive making, making that, that kind of jump. Um, so there's, there's a question here from Albert, uh, which, uh, who's a, a regular on our uh, Lumix live sessions here. Uh, mm -hmm. And he has a question for you that says, uh, so what camera are you shooting on currently? And are megapixels important for the work you do? Okay, I currently shoot with, uh, I have uh, three G9s and two GX8s. So um, they're both 20 megapixels, and uh, those 20 megapixels are enough for me. Um, you know, I shoot for, well, I shoot for Montclair State. I also shoot for you know, a number of other freelance clients. And uh, I would say that what I get out of the GX8 is, is really more than enough. I'm going to... Uh, share um, share a screen with you guys. Yeah. Um, share a window like this one. And uh, uh, just as a reminder, everybody, uh, if you guys have questions as we're going through this, make sure to drop them in the chat bar and tag at Lumix Cameras so that uh, Mike and I can answer them for you. So obviously we're going to be looking at some of Mike's work here. So if you have questions, make sure to ask them. So these were uh, these were recently installed in our admissions department, um, and you know all of these images that are you know now over eight feet tall uh, were shot in a micro four thirds camera. Yeah. Uh, so you know they really hold up very nicely when you're standing next to them. Uh, you know it's uh, I don't know it's it's twenty <laughs> megapixels. It's, it's really, it's enough. This was a, so this is, so I shot this sort of on the run. This girl was like walking very quickly. Uh, it was continuous autofocus. I think it was with the, the 50 to 200 and bingo. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's dusk out. That's the picture. I mean, yeah. it's like, I don't know how much more, how much more, you know, you need than 20 megapixels. Most, most, Full frame cameras are shooting 24, you know, unless you go with like a S1R, then you got 47. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't need to have that much information pushing through every day because I, you know, I shoot probably tens of thousands of photos like every month. And I have to be able to ingest them all and handle them all and process them. So. Yeah, and for for a lot of people, I think that's, that's um, kind of one of the, the, I don't want to say issues going on in, in, in the industry these days, but it's, there's always that big push for the megapixel race. And I think what gets lost a lot of times is that there's, there's so much about, you know, picking the right tool for the right job. And your, your experience, I think is that perfect example of it. Like, you know, yes, having 47 megapixels for landscape work, it's awesome. I, I love my <laughs> S1R. I love shooting with my S1R, but if I'm going out on the street and I'm just, you know, photographing what's around me, or if I'm working where, you know, you, you have to deliver, like you said, tens of thousands of images every month, you really don't want to be working with 47 megapixel files unless you really have to. <laughs> right. And, you know, I mean, this is proof. I mean, it's, I also have, uh, there's some images in the, in the student center that I shot with the GH3 that are like 30 feet wide. And it was a photograph of a guy playing guitar. And you can see, like, the striations on the guitar string. You can see the stitching on his jeans. It's from a 16-megapixel camera. Exactly. <laughs> I, I remember when I, when I got my first, uh, the, the Canon 1DS Mark II was 16 megapixels. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I, I died and went to heaven. This is all I'll ever need. <laughs> and really, it is. All you really ever need is 16 megapixels is more than enough, especially if it's a, a well-designed chip and... 
I find that the uh, you know the, the chips in the Lumix cameras are really they have they it's you know it's, it's it's a good balance between you know color and 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 also sensitivity. They're not really noisy. I'm very very comfortable shooting up to 6400 without any issue whatsoever, and I'll go up to what the 12.8. Um, yeah. And so long as I'm careful with exposure, it's perfectly fine. And if you pr if you shoot raw and you process it right, and you're careful about you know how you sharpen things, don't over sharpen them, and how you would how you put in your your um, noise reduction settings, you, know, you can get really great results without again without any issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's I don't know. It's every, anything is possible with these cameras. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, so there's there's another question here from. Uh, I think it's McDrew uh, is asking you um, if you could give us a little bit of insight kind of on your workflow when like, like how you manage all of those images in a month, like how, how do you get through that many images or, you know, for, for a standard job? Um, <laughs> no, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. On a standard job or, so, or, or even an unstandard job. So say if I'm photographing a commencement or a convocation, yeah. um, you know, it's a big event, it's multi hours. I may, generate anywhere from three to 5,000 images. Um, I shoot a lot of frames. I shoot because one of the things I've noticed is over the years when is people blink. People blink in the background. People blink, you know, they, they, they do weird things. So it's like I like to give myself a lot of options. So I'd rather go in later and pick the right frame than, than miss it. So I shoot a lot of frames. Um, but I tend to be processing the files very soon after the event. So I can very quickly go in and load them all up. I'll make sure that I time sync the cameras and I put all of the files into one, one folder and then I, I sort them in a, a date created. I'll rename them all um, and, then, and then I'll sort them by file name. But then I can very quickly go through with my left and right arrows and just, you know, bing, 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 bing star, bing, 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 star, bing, 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 whatever. You know, when I yeah. see the image, I know the image I want when I see it, and I just hit the star. So I'll go through all the files. I can go, I can go through a couple thousand pictures in probably less than 45 minutes. Yeah. So, and then, and then I'll pick up my selects. I'll put them in a separate folder, and I'll open, uh, like, chunks of those up, like, all of this and, and from, from this section, all of them from this section. And I'll do a common color balance. Um, I have a preset that automatically gets put on every file as soon as I open it up in Bridge. And then uh, I go in and tweak from there. But every image gets looked at and every image, pretty much every image gets tweaked. Yeah. So I only ever shoot in available light. Uh, sometimes there's more light available than others. And uh, so, you know, there's a, I don't, when I'm shooting, I don't worry about color balance issues. I deal with that after the fact. And, uh, you know, I'll just make all of my adjustments there. You know, I liberally burn and dodge as I need to. Um, but, you know, my main consideration is to get a nice full tonal range from, you know, information in the highlights to, you know, nice information in the shadows. Um, so, you know, it's a, I have a sort of a set point in my head from shooting film for, 35 years that I sort of know what I want color to look like and tonal range. And uh, so that's pretty much almost automatically what my brain goes to when I'm processing. So yeah. I, I can, I can uh, come back from a job. I can have, you know, 5,000 images and in less than three hours, I can have them all sorted, renamed, um, processed, adjusted, and posted up on the internet for, uh, for posting on social media and our website at the university. Yeah. So I'm very quick about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, I, I, obviously that's, that's one of the things I think that really, you know, probably, as you mentioned, comes from, you know, your, your time working in film, you know, and, and working in a true professional sense, time is money. So, right. you know, you really don't want to be spending hours and hours and hours, you know, ultimately refining a photo to its like, top pinnacle, you know, of, of amazingness. If it one, if it doesn't have to, and two, if you've had enough experience and understand, you know, the, the 
image you're trying to get out of your head, if you get it as close as possible at the time of shooting, then it really doesn't come into a lot of having to sit in front of Photoshop. Right. Um, shoot, yeah, shoot it right in the camera and you'll be much better off. And that's something I learned by shooting color transparencies. You know, Kodachrome, oh, yeah. you got one shot at it. You either got it right or you got it wrong. And, you know, I try to apply the same thought process to shooting digital, which is, is get it as right as I can. But, you know, with digital, you can also, you know, your main thing is to watch the highlights. But you yep. can always pop the shadows. And I find that the, the capacity to dig information out of the shadows is, is really significant with these cameras. Yeah. So that's one of the things I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's one of those things that I, I I love recommending to people when they ask, you know, the the questions of like, so so, how do you get into photography? And I I'm still someone that to this day, when I get that question, I always recommend people like go out, get a cheap 35 millimeter film camera, and shoot a couple rolls of film, to really get a good understanding of photography. Now, for everyone watching that's videographers. It's a little more difficult to tell you to go out and get, you know, eight millimeter film and, and go shoot on film to get an experience. But film photography is still a relatively accessible thing these days. I mean, a lot of companies are still producing film. You can pick up secondhand film cameras and get yourself a good base, you know, to to, to your point, Mike, you know, if if you have the ability to shoot chrome film, go try that. That right. is, that taught me so much about color theory. And like you said, you have one shot, get it right. right. And the latitude is not there. You you, yeah, you can't no take attitude. a shot three stops under and try to fix it. It's got to be right in camera. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and that, you know, and, and, you know, it's like, you know, there's a distinction. There's photography, which is basically film-based. And then there's digital imaging. And, yeah. you know, people who haven't had the experience with, photography per se by shooting film they don't always have that set point as to what a photograph can look like or should look like now you know maybe i'm old-fashioned about it oh i'm old but it's uh you know it's like i have that set point based on years of shooting kodachrome and ektachrome fujichrome color negative film i mean i know what the various different media can produce i shot lots and lots of black and white um and basically, all of the skills that I learned by shooting film, especially in the dark room, uh, I've translated to digital. Um, you know, because yeah. Photoshop is basically it's a dark room on steroids, and you can you can abuse it. You can you can make things look ridiculous if you want, <laughs> um, or you can use it like like an enlarger. Like I used to use, you know. So I don't really do much to my images beyond um, burning and dodging, and you know maybe adjusting color. Um, I try to shoot it in terms of like, sometimes, you know, that I need to produce, uh, an image in a 16 by nine format for mm -hmm. our, uh, webpage, you know, for the hero shot. Uh, and then other times, you know, I'm free to just shoot four three. And, uh, so I try to like really sort of compose it as I want it to be in the camera. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't do a lot of, uh, uh, cropping after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for those that are joining us, I mean, that's one of the, the kind of benefits with the entire Lumix system, whether you're on the Micro Four Thirds platform or if you're on the S-Series and the L-Mount, all of our cameras allow you to put a 16x9 or a 1x1. One one. Uh, if you're in the S-Series, it has 65x24 and 2x1, which are actually some of my favorite aspect ratios to shoot in, sure. um, so that you can actually visualize what the image is going to look like. And if you shoot raw plus JPEG, it'll tag everything right. Um, so that you, you have the flexibility to, to have that visual point before you actually take the picture. Um, right. And, and to one of the points in, in, uh, in, in the comments that uh, uh, FC just brought up was uh, recommending to go out and get a G7 if you're starting off in photography. And, and yes, very much so. If you're getting into this, the G7 is an amazing camera to get into this uh, if you're looking in digital photography. Um, I, I would say get a G7 plus pick up a film camera. So, you know, you've you've got your, your ease of access into digital and you've got that really fun, exciting thing of film to shoot with. Um, especially because you have to wait for the film to come back to you. Um, yeah. if, if you can actually get the negatives, that's even better. A lot of places now don't actually give you the negatives back. Um, 
So there, there's another question here, uh, Mike, from uh, Ricardo, which is asking, uh, do you shoot JPEGs or RAW for your work? I only shoot RAW. I never shoot JPEGs. <laughs> really, ever. Um, you know, unless, unless I need to actually pull something right out of the camera and send it to, uh, to a, you know, to a client right away because they need to post it on social media. Otherwise, I even still prefer to shoot raw and process the raw in the camera and generate a JPEG from there. Yeah. So I, uh, to me, you know, shooting JPEG is, I, I don't know. It's like I, I, shooting raw is like having the negative. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost infinite what you can do with it. You know, you you basically raw gives you this much information and a JPEG throws it all out and gives you like this much. And, <laughs> you know, well, I want, I want all of that. I don't want to throw any of it away. And, uh, I'm sort of greedy, but I only ever keep <laughs> raw. Man, I keep all of them like forever. Um, I have, at work here, I have a 64 terabyte drive, and uh, it's about two thirds full. <laughs> and at home, <laughs> at home, I have uh, I have uh, 40 terabytes of hard drive, and that's probably also about two thirds full. So oh, yeah. uh, I always keep the raw files. Which you know, that's 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 also a good you know kind of throwback to when we were talking about resolution in cameras. You know. Thinking about the fact that, you know, you, you shoot with 20 megapixel micro four thirds cameras, 64 terabytes of storage that holds a substantial amount of images. Um, if I were to shoot as much on an S1R for the resolution on the camera, I would be going through storage like crazy. Yeah. Just, just, just on the sheer fact that the file sizes are that much bigger. So for, for a lot of people that are out there looking and trying to figure out, well, okay, which camera do you want to go with? A lot of it comes down to your priorities are, you know, is resolution your ultimate priority? You know, we've, we've already kind of proven to a, a bit that, you know, you don't necessarily need to have 47 megapixels to make an eight foot tall, 20 foot wide print. Mike right. is, is, is proof of that. You know, you're able to do it with, with 16 megapixel and 20 megapixel micro four thirds cameras. Everything else really above that is just extra. And, and for pixel peeping and, and everyone that loves to do that, this is not a slight on anyone that loves pixel peeping. I love pixel peeping when you get that ultimate, like critically sharp image and you can just keep yeah. zooming in for days and days and days. It's great. But from a practical standpoint, I couldn't imagine shooting a wedding with, anything more than 20 to 24 megapixels. It, it ends up just becoming way overkill, I think, for, for a lot of use cases. Right. And, you know, it's like you can print really big and get really great looking results. Uh, a friend of mine in town shoots with a couple of GX8s and he does, uh, he does family portraits and, and, and stuff like that. And he makes these huge prints. He used to shoot with a Canon 5D Mark II. He saw what I was doing and he said, wow, I really like that camera. So he, he actually, I, I sold him one of my GX8s uh, years ago, and I wound up buying more GX8s in the meanwhile. But uh, he loved it. He loves the eye control, the, uh, the eye focus. Uh, you know, it's just, it works perfectly for him. And uh, instead of having to shoot at F8 to get adequate depth of field, now he can shoot at F4 and get the same depth of field. And yeah. you'll wind up with more light coming in and a lower ISO to boot. So it, that works out for him. And that's a lot of people don't necessarily realize that, you know, with the micro four thirds, you know, with full frame, if you, you, know, you need to get a lot of focus, you're shooting F11, F16. Well, you know, with micro four thirds, you're shooting maybe 5.6 and you get a lot of stuff in focus. And you can also get very shallow depth of field. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I wind up shooting a lot of stuff uh, pretty much wide open. Um, you know, if, I don't know, let's see. <laughs> so, uh, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, so it's, oh, no, I did that wrong. I did that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see, well, while you're doing that, we've got a couple more questions in here. Let's see uh, what we can do. Um, so one of the questions was from WJ Smith, which is more of a general question. Um, 
uh, was asking about uh, shooting when you have the crop into 16 by 9. Um, and Jack, uh, who's in the chat answering questions uh, that we may not get to live here on the, the broadcast, um, you know, g- gave the answer back that, you know, JPEG is the only one when you lose quote unquote quality. Um, and I think that's something that I want to maybe kind of clarify for some there is that when you, when you reference quality, you know, actual image quality, cropping, it, at least in, in, in my definition of it, is not reducing image quality. Um, quality is going to be shadow detail, highlight detail, tonal range, dynamic range, things like that. Cropping's never going to, to minimize or lose anything like that. What's awesome about the more recent Lumix cameras, though, um, and this is what Jack uh, was referencing with raw images, it's still capturing full sensor, is that if you throw that 16 by 9 aspect ratio in the camera while you're shooting raw, or a 1 by 1 ratio so you can shoot square, your raw file still has the entire 4 by 3 or 3 by 2 aspect ratio uh, image. So you still have the full image at your disposal. So to Mike's point, you're not throwing anything away when you shoot raw. It'll tag Lightroom and Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw and most raw platforms. It'll tag them to show you, hey, you you asked for this image to be cropped square or you asked it to be cropped 16 by 9. And that's how it'll show it to you. But you always have the ability to re-crop later if, if, if um, you need be. Um, so there's a question here from Trix46 uh, for you, Mike, which is, uh, okay. w- what's your favorite prime lens? Oh boy! Um, <laughs> for, for my personal work, my favorite prime lens is the um, 25 Sumalux. Uh, just 25 millimeter 1.4. It's just perfect for just about all the work that I do on the street. Um, for commercial work, uh, my favorite prime lens is the 10 to 25 zoom, <laughs> which isn't a prime at all, but it's a, it's actually like having a, I don't know, like seven or eight primes all in one lens. Yeah. Um, but uh, I also use the, uh, the 42 and a half Noctocron a lot. Um, I love that which, lens. <laughs> which is just spectacular. Um, when I go out and shoot for myself, I'll carry the 15... Sumalux, the 25 Sumalux, and the uh, and the 42 and a half Noctocron, and those are my three lenses. Primarily, I'm using the 25 though. <laughs> See, it's funny because no matter what, I always have those lenses with me now, except one oh, of these is the that? 12. So, <laughs> okay, the 12 is really nice. <laughs> I love the 12. I mean, like this is it on the box camera. So, for those that don't know, this is the box camera that we announced. That's the 12 millimeter on it, and you know, to, to what Mike's saying, they're they're ridiculously awesome lenses and you realize how small some of these things are for your kit. Like that, that 15 millimeter, that thing is, it's 30 millimeter for those that are thinking in 35 millimeter field of view equivalent, but it's a 1.7. I, I think that lens is spectacular to, to just walk around with and, and always have glued to your camera. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Not much you can't do with that lens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What's, uh, what do we got an- another question in here too? Um, let's see. Uh, a question about night photography. I'm going to hold that one till the end. Uh, and I'll give you, we'll, we'll give you some recommendations on that. Um, Albert's asking your GX eights. Do you have a silver GX eight or you have the black ones? Actually I have two black ones. <laughs> so I find I find those there are uh, I like to shoot with those on the street because I can flip up the viewfinder mm-hmm. and it, it puts my point of view down uh, a little lower than my six foot height. Also, it gives me a very similar shooting experience that I used to have when shooting with the uh, the Hasselblads and the Rolleiflexes with the forty five degree prism. Yeah. So it it puts me a little below people's chins, which I like. Um, because I don't want to feel like I'm shooting down, being oppressive on people. I want to be more eye level, and the uh, um, you know having that that flip up binder really helps. Um, so I, I I like that camera a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was I think one of the one of the first Micro Four Thirds cameras that I actually bought myself. 
was a was a, a silver GX8 when I first started working for Panasonic. So okay, yeah, definitely a fun camera. It's kicking around somewhere in like one of my closets, I think. Uh, at least I think, because yeah. I did move and a bunch of my stuff is spread across the country. So who ah, knows? <laughs> oh, all right, yeah. Um, let's hear. There's uh, uh, we have another question here from uh, Dennis asking, uh, what do you do with the reject photos? Um, do you save those as well? And if you do, why? Uh, I do save them, and why? Um, I think I don't know why because I'm probably out of my mind. Um, <laughs> and but you know, it's like I always, it's like so I saved all of my negatives too, and I have, I have like 35 years worth of negatives that I'm still going through. And, you know, sometimes I go back and I look at stuff and it's like, uh, you know what? I know I chose that one, but I think I like this one better now because, you know, tastes change. And, uh, you know, for some reason I want to have a complete archive. So this way, at least this way, it's a really big load for my kids to throw away when I die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's just, I just... Why throw it away? You, you know, very true. I, there's there's such a nice thing actually going back to some of the old photos that that you take and reimagining them. I mean, it, let, let's face it the the style that any of us shoot that that you you know just like you were saying a second ago, the style that you shoot now is not the same style that you would have shot a year ago or two years ago because we're always no matter what, when you're in this field, you're always still learning something. You're seeing what somebody else has done, a different editing style or, you know, a, a different approach as to what makes a good looking image in, in your view. So going back and looking at the old, you know, quote unquote rejects, I think is a fun thing to do, actually. It is. It's also, you know, so I, I shoot a lot for myself. And so I have I've come up with a like a style of shooting that um, I think is consistent with who I am. And, you know, for a while, I guess it was like back in the early 2000s, I was sort of searching a little bit and I was able to go back through my old files and find sort of a very common thread sort of from, you know, from the, the mid 70s up until that point. And it was like, ah, OK, so so I was doing this all along, but I didn't realize it. So going back through your old work can really be very uh, uh, instructive. You know, you can you can learn a lot by by looking as Yogi Berra once said. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I probably got that wrong, but nonetheless. Yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I, I know um, there were a couple other images that, that we were taking a look at before. Um, you want to show some more of the work for those that are uh, interested? Because there's a lot of people that have been asking, you know, where they can see your work. So we'll, we'll definitely cover that. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you can go to my website, uh, mikepetersphotography.com, uh, mikepeters-photography.com. But, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, would you, would you like me to show, you know, work I do here or MSU, or would you like to see more personal work? Uh, let's let's um uh, take take a look at some of the, the personal work, because I think that's that's some of the, the stuff that, at least from from my my personal uh, view, I, I I've always loved looking, you know, at your personal projects that that you shoot. the the work for MSU and and stuff like that, commercial work. That's that stuff's amazing. But personal work, I think, really gives that that insight into the photographer's view on things, which is always yeah. fun. Yeah, I, I want to start with a uh, with a project that I started. Uh, shooting on film uh, back, you know, uh, I guess it was 2010, maybe. Um, I started standing on the corner of uh, 42nd Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, one day I was coming home from the city after shooting, and uh, I was waiting for, you know, I had some time to kill before my bus. I just didn't want to get on, get on the bus yet. So I stood there, I said goodbye to my friend, and... Uh, I noticed uh, that people would stop and uh, and just wait for the light to change uh, before they would go over to uh, the Port Authority bus terminal. And every time I went into the city, you know, I would take the bus and I would stop and I would wait and I would just sort of watch people and I was just sort of interested in people's uh, facial expressions and body language. Um, you know, it's like you know, what did they? What was written on their face? 
And, you know, I originally started shooting this with the Hasselblad. Um, and then uh, after I got rid of the Hasselblad, I started shooting with, uh, you know, with the Lumix cameras, also continuing to shoot square. Uh, with the Hasselblad, I was mostly shooting with the uh, the 110 F2, and uh, with with the uh, the Lumix, I shoot uh, pretty much primarily with the uh, uh, 25 millimeter 1.4. And uh, you know, the 110 F2, which is what this is, wide open, is is really it's pretty dreamy. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can you can get you know pretty. Uh, you know, pretty nice backgrounds, uh, pretty shallow depth of field when you need to. Uh, I pretty much only ever shoot the prime lenses wide open. Yeah. Uh, and then another uh, another project that I started uh, on film, um, and I, I, I was always intrigued by the meatpacking district down in Lower Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, on 14th Street. And I wanted to shoot at night, and because I was shooting with the Hasselblad, um, you really can't shoot at night, so I brought a, a friend of mine who uh, who held a, a strobe on a stick with an umbrella, and uh, and I lit these all. So I would stop and I would ask people. The previous project that I showed you, I didn't ask anybody. I just took those photographs. Yeah, they were just completely candid. But with these, because I was shooting with a flash, um, you know, I had to ask. <laughs> and so you know, I started again with the Hasselblad, and. Uh, when I finally transitioned to digital, um, you know, it actually it was a lot easier because the autofocus was so much better. It was so hard to focus <laughs> these like with the Hasselblad. Oh yeah. Um, but um, so, but when I when I switched over to digital, uh, one of the things that I did is I is I, I kept the light, so this way they would have a consistent look. Um, so you you know it was the, the the difference between the film and the digital was. You know, you really couldn't tell the difference so much. Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, very similar in terms of, you know, the look and the feel. It's just that now I'm shooting digital. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's a fun process. Oh, yeah. So. And that's, that's, that's actually something cool, I think, too, is, is you know, carrying, carrying that, that format over you know, still shooting square and being able to, to, you know, just like you said, looking at these images, cycling through, seeing how, you know, yeah, the, the images that are medium format, you can tell because obviously, well, for one, those that know what, what we look for, the notches on the Hasselblad film, right. <laughs> it's kind of right. always a, an easy dead giveaway, but there's just something so cool about shooting square that a lot of people I don't think do anymore. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a real challenge to uh, to compose in square, but I find it's a good challenge. Um, yeah. Makes it a little harder. One of the things I do with with the film is I always I always keep the film edges, mm -hmm. so you get to see the uh, the edges of the film, you know the notches, the you know the the black around the edge. But when I shoot digital, because I'm not shooting film, I don't include that because like, there's nothing to include. But yeah. I, I, li I like to show the edges because it shows that, you know, I haven't cropped anything. So. <laughs> very true. Very true. So, you know, it's like, but it's it still has a similar feel to it, even though it's a different, different you know, it's a different way of shooting. You know, I just try to keep the... Uh, you know, my sensibility the same. Yeah. So, but, you know, and now with digital, I can shoot in the subways without, you know, having to worry about it. Um, you know, it's, there's all kinds of things you can do with, with digital that you couldn't do with film. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is an image that I could never have done on film. Um, you know, I saw this woman walking up the street and she passed me by and I basically started walking really fast, got way past her. I saw the Broadway magic sign and I just sort of waited for her to sort of approach me. And I had the 15 millimeter lens on my, uh, I don't know, whichever camera it was at the time and raised it. And I got one frame and, you know, the, the autofocus nailed it. Um, the lens was, I was shooting wide open. It was pretty dim under there and it's uh, really worked out well. 
yeah. but I couldn't have done it uh, with film. <laughs> so, you know, I try to take advantage of, 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 of what digital gives me. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to, to have the flexibility that I have now. Yeah. So, well, uh, so let's see, we're, we're getting up, uh, pretty much right, right at the top of the hour. So, um, we're probably going to wrap this up. Um, okay. I know, um, obviously there's so much that we can talk about with, with your work and the photography. So before we go, um, could you, uh, again, let, let everyone know, uh, where they can find your work, where they can see examples of, of what you do online. Sure. Uh, my website is uh, mikepeters-photography.com, or you can go to mikepeters.com, which will redirect you to my website. Um, that was my, my old website. Um, everything is there. There's uh, links to most of the projects that I showed, and then also links to, there's a link to the work that I do for Montclair State, uh, which shows a fairly complete portfolio of, of images. So, um, or if you just go to the Montclair State website, montclair.edu, um, you know, you can see stuff there, but that changes every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, again, I, thank you, Mike, for, for taking the time. Um, this, this, this was awesome catching up and, and seeing some of your work. Um, for everybody that is in the chat, we will put the links to the website and, uh, and Mike's work in the description once this uh, video goes live. Uh, so you, you'll be able to take a look there. Um, again, Thank you, Mike. Uh, I, I, you. I really, really appreciate the, the time you spent with us today. Well, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, yammer on about my work. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun. It's always fun. And Absolutely. <laughs> well, so for, for everyone, again, thank you all for taking the time and joining us this week uh, for Lumix Live. Uh, we love these, these events every week. They are designed, again, specifically so that all of you have access to chat with us, to give us your opinions on product, learn something new from photographers and videographers out in the, in the working field, uh, and, and just provide a great community for everyone to also help each other out. So we will be live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time for our monthly wrap up, which is now our AMA sessions. So the questions that everyone asked in this session in the Lumix BGH1 box launch uh, videos over the last couple of weeks, I uh, will all be getting uh, collected in and addressed uh, next week's session. So be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon on the Lumix video that you're watching right now. And we will see everybody in next week's session. Thanks for watching. <laughs>